do you see from this section, picture of, uh, of Ohio State campus in wintertime, if you're a bug, there aren't too many resources out there to eat. There's not much food, and it's rather cold. Um, most insects, well, there are a few insects like the monarch butterfly and some of the milkweed bugs that fly off to warmer climes, but most of them hunker down where they are and enter a dormant state that we call diapause. And in my talk this afternoon, I'm going to first you know, sort of give an overview of diapause and then the second half focus in on uh, the, uh, some of our more recent work with uh, the mosquito Culex pipiens and its diapause. Uh, diapause is a rather complex phenotype. There are a number of different features that, that characterize diapause. Of course, it's developmental rest, uh, decreased metabolic rate, a number of different uh, features here that come together to make up what we uh, refer to as the, the diapause phenotype. And you see it is a diversity of different features that would not appear to be necessarily closely related, uh, but are really important for the diapause response. So I'll just tell you a little bit more about what I mean by some of these uh, things. Now, uh, this diapause is, an, uh, is something that for each species is, occurs at a specific stage. For example, if you're a, um, a gypsy moth, you'll diapause as an egg, as an embryo, actually. If you're European corn borer, you'll do it as a larva. If you're one of these Ragolitis flies, you'll do it as a pupa. If you're a Colorado potato beetle, you'll do it as an adult. There are a few species that can diapause in a couple different stages, but that's, uh, that's pretty rare. But this kind of stage specificity is very, uh, very uh, common. And we do a lot of our work with flesh flies, the sort of the elephants of the fly world. Uh, this fly is ovoviviparous. The larvae hatch inside the uterus. The female, she gives birth to four, first in star active larvae that feed on carrion, so they can go in and exploit that resource right away. This is a third instar larva that has finished its feeding, and at this point, um, you know, in the lab we rear them on beef liver, and I get accused of trying to take over more territory by stinking everyone else out of the uh, adjacent labs. Uh, but okay, this is a larva that's finished its feeding. At that point, they burrow down into the soil, form a puparium that looks like this. Now, in the next slide, I've popped off the cap of the puparium so you can see what's happening inside. Now, if you rear these flies under long day conditions, within a few days, you see signs of adult differentiation. The eyes become pigmented, black bristles form, and in about 14 days, an adult uh, fly emerges. But those that are reared under short day conditions remain in this white, undifferentiated state, and they'll remain that way for nine or 10 months during the, during the winter months. Now, these guys did go through a stage like this, but they just passed through it within a day or so and went on with development. So they're, they're locked into that developmental stage for a, for a long time. Again, one of the advantages of the large size of this fly enabled us to do, especially in our, some of our early years, a number of uh, surgical manipulations and things that were rather important that uh, um, were kind of fun to be able to, some advantages, and when I now do a lot of work with mosquitoes, I, I do appreciate these flies a lot. Okay, by uh, the metabolic arrest, what, we, what I'm showing here is oxygen consumption cycle, uh, oxygen consumption in a non-diapausing fly from the time it forms a puparium until it emerges as an adult. For any insect, there has a characteristic U-shaped curve like this. Of, it's characteristic of any animal going through uh, metamorphosis. You'll see a U-shape like that. Now, the diapausing ones start off at this same level, but they drop and keep on dropping down to a uh, level you know, about tenfold lower than the lowest point you ever see in, that, uh, non, in the non-diapausing animal. So you can appreciate the metabolic economy of, of diapause, in, uh, especially in something like this in a pupa. Now, associated with that, uh, you have a major, some major shifts to uh, glycolysis and the gluconeogenic uh, pathways that are, uh, that are emphasized during diapause. Things you're essentially changing in many cases from an aerobic form of metabolism to an anaerobic uh, shutdown. So you see a lot of gene changes that are linked to that, that that's sort of a shift. Another very important feature of diapause is to be able to maintain your water resources. If you're going to uh, be a pupa, for example, go into diapause in the fall and have to go the whole way until the next spring, um, 
you don't have any, chance, you, any opportunity to drink as a pupa, so you have to be able to maintain those water resources, and that's a terribly important thing to be able to do during diapause. And usually, you'll find diapausing insects have some mechanisms that are, will allow them to do that. And just looking here at the water loss rates, you see a non-diapausing pupa loses water pretty quickly, whereas that diapausing one um, loses water at a much lower rate. And much of this is attributed to the fact that, of course, they have a lower metabolic rate. That certainly helps. But in addition to that, they often have special waterproofing mechanisms that they, they evoke. And in this case, these are a bunch of empty puparia. And when we compare uh, empty puparia from ones that had been in diapause versus ones not in diapause, you see that these puparia of the diapausy ones are lined with about twice the amount of hydrocarbon. And it's here in the inside, and the inside of the puparium is lined with really a, a lot more uh, hydrocarbons. The same group of about 23 or so hydrocarbons are present in both, just that the diapausy ones make a lot more of them and make, make a really nice uh, waterproof uh, um, event occurring. Often with diapause too, there's uh, much like a bear going into hibernation, sequesters additional fat reserves before it enters uh, hibernation. A number of insects will uh, sequester additional fat reserves prior to entry into diapause. And this is again, uh, data from the flesh fly. This is during the third instar, the final larval instar. You see they start the larval instar uh, at about the same amount of fat content and the non-diapausy ones uh, don't accumulate that much fat. Those that are going into diapause have uh, uh, packed on about twice the amount of fat uh, as their other uh, counterparts. Now, this doesn't happen in all insects. There are some insects where you detect no difference at all in the amount of fat you know, prior to the entry uh, into diapause, but it, it's fairly common in a lot of insects. Also associated with diapause, they're often, uh, especially in temperate regions where you have uh, low temperatures that you experience. Uh, there'll be cold hardiness mechanisms that uh, come into play. In the case of, again, the flesh flies, here we're measuring the super cooling point. This is the point at which the body actually freezes. And you can see the super cooling point during the larval stage is about minus 10 or so. And then as they move toward uh, puparium formation and enter the pupil stage, one of the things they do uh, very quickly is to purge their gut, and they're done feeding, they purge their gut. The gut is full of all kinds of uh, potent ice nucleators, so they want to get rid of those, and then they also crank up the production of polyols, such as glycerol, that acts as a classic antifreeze and helps to lower this supercooling point, in this case, to about minus 22 or so during diapause. When diapause ends, it goes up again. So this addition of glycerol is much like what you do um, here in the winter to add antifreeze to your car radiator to lower the super cooling point to prevent that block from burning, these guys from, from freezing. So that's exactly analogous to what these bugs are doing, turning on the production of some sort of an antifreeze to, to protect them from, uh, from freezing. So this is a species that if the temperature goes below the supercooling point, they're dead. So it's, it's a freeze intolerant species. There are a few species that uh, in temperate regions that, that can uh, tolerate body freezing, but they're, uh, they're much more in the minority. Most, many, many more insects are in this freeze intolerant category. Okay, another thing that we often see with diapause is an arrest in the cell cycle. This is simply show, a diagram showing the cell cycle and the various players that keep the cell cycle going. In the case of our flesh flies, this PCNA stands for proliferating cell nuclear antigen, and it's one of the regulators of the cell cycle. In our flesh flies, PCNA is, shut, is turned down, and when that's not present, you shut down the cell cycle. There are a lot of other ways you can shut down the cell cycle, and for um, insects, they're all seem to be doing some shutting down the cell cycle in one way or other, but they're using different players. Some are using certain cyclins to shut it down. But, so you can achieve the same end a number of different ways. The flies do it with, with PCNA, uh, but you know, the cell cycle arrest is pretty common um, in a diapause. And here you can see, <clears throat> here we're using flow cytometry to see the stage of the cell cycle that uh, the brain cells are in. 
You see non-diapausine pupil brains are represented in the GO1S and the G2M phase of the cell cycle, whereas the brains, the cells in the brain of the diapausine pupil are all locked into this GO, G1 cell cycle arrest. So those kinds of arrests are, uh, you know, cell cycle arrests are, are pretty common to diapause. Well, also uh, another feature that you commonly see in diapause is some elevation of some of the stress response genes. Um, what I'm showing here are the uh, are northern blots of the HEATSHOCK 70 gene. Uh, this are you know, just a number of different species showing that the HEATSHOCK 70 gene is turned on by virtue of the animal uh, going into diapause. You don't have to do any special uh, temperature tricks or anything to make them go in. Just once they enter diapause, they turn on these heat shock proteins. We can use RNAi to knock down those heat shock proteins, and when they, we do that, they lose their cold tolerance. So we think this is you know, a critical aspect of, uh, of uh, surviving during the winter. But in addition to the heat shock proteins, there are usually a lot of other um, you know, immune response sorts of genes that are turned on, defensins and uh, hemo, uh, hemo uh, what's that, hemolin, uh, uh, yeah, hemolin in cecropia. There are a number of defense-related genes that are very commonly turned on, and that's, you can understand and appreciate why you might want to turn those on before you go heavily into diapause, because you shut down much of your metabolism. You have those genes turned on, you're ready. Many of these insects are, you know, say, underground in, uh, for months at a time where they could be vulnerable to attack by fungi or bacteria, and it's uh, probably good to have those defense mechanisms uh, up and ready to go to, for defense. We often uh, uh, consider diapauses of two types, obligatory and facultative. An obligatory diapause is one that doesn't require any special environmental factor to put it into diapause. It's something that happens every generation regardless of the uh, photo period or temperature. And an example of this would be the gypsy moth. Every year, I mean, every time an embryo is uh, formed, they will go into this uh, diapause. It's, you know, it's a fixed thing. You can try all kinds of environmental manipulations, you won't change it. They, they go into diapause in response to, uh, you know, just to, it's a genetically programmed uh, event. That is in contrast to the much more common event of a facultative diapause that is actually programmed by the environment that that animal, or it's maybe its mother, or uh, at any rate, that, that's manipulated by the environment. And very commonly, uh, photoperiod is important, Temperatures often plays an important role. And many of the tropical insects and diapauses, uh, although I you know, sort of alluded to a, a temperate event, it's very, very common in the tropics as well, often geared to rainfall patterns and uh, some really neat things happening there as well. So uh, by photo period, let me just give you an example here, looking, plotting diapause incidents. These are for the flesh flies. And if you rear them under different hours of light per day, if you rear them under long day conditions of uh, yeah, out here, you get no diapause. Under short day conditions, you get a high incidence of diapause. This is data uh, collected at 25 degrees. If you rear them at 20 degrees, it shoots this up to about 100%. You can see this really sharp drop between, in contrast between non-diapause and diapause occurring here at about 13 and a half hours of light. I mean, these flies are being able to distinguish you know, 13 and a half from 13 and three quarters hours of light, very sophisticated clock that uh, measures clock in a way that uh, I think is pretty impressive. <clears throat> and it's not usually the photo period that uh, throughout all of their life, it's usually a fairly specific period that we call the critical uh, period or the sensitive stage for the diapause uh, induction. And again, a, an example here from the flesh flies if they receive short days here during the last two days of embryonic development, in this case inside the mother, in the first two days of larval life, that puts them into diapause out here as a pupae. It doesn't matter what photoperiod they receive out here for this during this time, it's already been programmed. And the beauty of this, and this is why we often refer to it as an anticipated response, they get that signal early and they can anticipate that they're going in and they can make the adjustments. They can you know, make the adjustments during larval life, sequester additional lipids and do those sorts of things. It's not an immediate response to, uh, to the conditions that uh, prevail, but usually programmed during a, a rather narrow window, uh, fairly far in advance sometimes. 
Okay, this picture from Salvador Dali is just there to remind me of this, what this means. And the, actually, it is anthropologically relevant. There are ants crawling over this, uh, uh, this thing. Yeah, they're on the clock. Um, but it, it really, a couple features of the clock that uh, are required. You have to be able to distinguish a short day from a long day. You have to be able to count the number of days that you receive. Then you have to be able to store that information to act on it at a much later stage of development. So those are sort of the critical features that have to go into uh, this kind of time measurement. Um, we know a good bit in uh, a lot of species that the brain, this is a picture of the brain of the flesh fly larvae, actually this is a ring gland here. In many of these cases, <clears throat> it, this light information is not coming in through the eyes, but it's coming directly on the brain. It's extra retinal perception. And you can black out the eyes often or uh, cauterize them so they're not functional, but, and they can still perceive the photoperiod. It, it's light that pinches directly on the brain. Uh, so I'm not going to go into details, but we have a lot of uh, information suggesting that, indeed, the brain is a recipient of this uh, photoperiodic information. Um, <clears throat> also, in some cases, it's the brain that decides how long the animal should stay in diapause. And this can actually be programmed uh, rather early, too. And this is, these are some experiments that we did at Manduka Sexta a number of years ago. Manduka, the, the uh, tobacco hornworm or tomato hornworm that has an adult like this big, this big sphingid. This is a pupa that, in this case, enters diapause over winters that way, and the larva here. Now, in this species, the diapause duration is affected by how many short days they received. So over here, these would be ones that were transferred to short days as soon as those eggs were laid. Egg hatch occurs here. You can actually, ones that do that have a very high diapause incidence, but you can see the duration is only about 70 days here, 25 degrees. And but whereas those transferred like at 10 days uh, uh, later, the diapause incidence is, is lower, and I don't show that data here, but the diapause duration is much longer. And this, again, makes some sort of sense. I mean, if you receive all short days, that means it's fairly late in the season. Now, yeah, what I should have said, in the case of Manduka, has a rather broad photosensitive time, as, as this implies. It starts in the egg, even before the egg hatches, and perceives, it continues on through uh, much of larval development. Um, so it's a fairly broad, unlike the flesh fly had just four days, this one has a rather broad photoperiod period of sensitivity. But you can imagine, the, you know, um, if Manduka was received all short days, that meant it was rather late in the season, and so they really don't have to enter a really long diapause. All they have to do is be able to stay in diapause until low temperatures set in, so they, uh, you know, it's going to carry them through the winter. Whereas some of these that would have had received something that initially would have been interpreted as long day, but then short day, that would be one that was developing earlier in the season, maybe in August or so, and then it, as it developed, then it started picking up short days late in development. Now in that case, um, it's important for it to have a much longer uh, diapause because it's earlier in the season, it has to wait a longer time until low temperature sets in. But anyway, this, uh, this backdrop uh, is uh, just to um, talk a little bit about, again, the brain is important in that decision. This is the Manduka's uh, pupa. This is open, I will open, cut open the head cavity here, and here's the brain uh, inside. Well, we can then go and do some uh, manipulations of this. And again, here we're plotting duration of diapause. And this is what we basically talked about in the last slide, a long diapause and a short diapause, you know, depending on how many short days they got. Well, if we go in, and simply loosen that brain, go in and, and you know, leave it in place, lift, well, you can lift it out and stick it back in again, you can see that they, well, it's extended the duration of the diapause, but they still, relative to each other, they still retain a long or a short diapause. And then the obvious next experiment, you just go in and flip those brains around, switch it to one to the other. And you can see that when you do that, you can carry with you that brain the duration, uh, the program for how long the diapause should remain. So those, so we have, you know, I think, uh, pretty good evidence mounting that uh, diapause, uh, the reception of that information is centers within the brain, and the brain is indeed is the recipient that determines how long the diapause should last. Okay, this, this slide, I just want to make the point that diapause is a dynamic state. You don't just go in and then you, you're in at a steady state until it ends. 
there are a lot of really neat things happening. When you look at oxygen consumption, for example, you see some really neat cycles that occur that become further apart in mid-diapause and closer together, and a lot of uh, dynamic events. But I, I I'll use just this example to show you from, in this case, from um, 80s albopictus. This is the uh, uh, Asian tiger mosquito that carries dengue. Uh, it was introduced into Houston a few years ago and used tires that we had the wisdom to import from Japan. I have no idea why we import used tires from Japan, but we do it. And we bring with it 80s uh, uh, albopictus that uh, is this vector of, uh, West Ni of uh, uh, dengue. And dengue now, of course, is in the southern tip of Florida. So you know, we're, we're set for some dengue around here as well. But what, what this is looking at transcripts at different times, 11, 21, and 40 days after the egg was deposited. This, has, this is a species that has an embryonic diapause. And what you see, what you're seeing here are the um, distinctions between the diapause and the non-diapause state. And you see early on in diapause, the, the, uh, the red and the black are, you know, they're, they're pretty well separated, but as you move toward uh, the end toward later on, you see uh, these reds emerge, emerge with the black, really implying that there's been a general uh, transition occurring during diapause that uh, where these, the transcript patterns that are present uh, sort of merge with each other. And at this point, uh, the animal is ready to, uh, ready to hatch and go on its way. So, I mean, that just sort of conveys that idea that diapause is indeed a dynamic state. It doesn't, uh, not a steady state uh, going on there. Um, okay, so we, we talked about the induction of diapause, a little bit about the termination, but I want to make the point that temperature and not photo period usually determines the, uh, when the uh, insects emerge in the spring. And the other point that I really want to make here is that diapause functions, okay, it's a great way to be able to survive the, uh, the winter and you know, adverse times, but it also serves as a terribly important role in synchronizing spring emergence of insects that may have entered diapause at very different times. And let me just show you what I mean by this. This would be some you know, hypothetical information taken from flesh flies. So in the fall, uh, you know, these flies are going to be entering diapause at somewhat different times. And they are locked into this period of, of latency that, uh, and after a while, just things uh, proceed, the temperature drops, you know, say you're early December or so here at this point. And this fixed period of latency is going to end at different times depending on uh, when they actually enter diapause. So, so this, this is a, a fixed amount of material, but they, all you really have to do is be able to get them past this point uh, where the temperatures in winter drop below that developmental threshold. So then we often refer to this period after that fixed latency period is, is uh, over as the post-diapause quiescence. At this point, the uh, insect is fully competent to develop, but the low temperatures at that time of the year prevent it. And in fact, for these flies, you bring them into the lab in October, November, December, there's still lag time before they develop. But by January 1, those, they're ready to go. And uh, I mean, it doesn't happen in the field because the temperatures are still low at that time. But that, they're fully competent to develop uh, by that time. And then, uh, so they, then they all get sort of stockpiled in this uh, post-diapause quiescence. And then as the temperature rises above the developmental threshold, somewhere you know, 12 degrees or so, then they progress with their development slowly, and they all emerge at exactly the same time. I mean, it's, it's uncanny, They'll, the, you know, they might enter diapause at months apart, but come out within a day or so of each other in the spring. And so this is, I mean, it's really important, of course, to come out when, uh, if you want a mate, uh, to come out when the, uh, uh, the opposite sex is around in great number. And this is uh, uh, sort of the beauty of, of how that can function as a really important synchronizer of life cycles. There are some costs of diapause sometimes that one sees. And, uh, in this case, we're looking at number of fertile eggs per female. And um, for ones non-diapausing, these flesh flies, Sarcophaga bolata, they are producing uh, about 40, 43 or so mean of eggs. Those that have been diapaused, uh, diapaused outside have only a, uh, you know, much fewer. And indeed, if 
If you artificially alter this duration of diapause, and we can do that very nicely in these flies by sprinkling a little hexane in their heads, it pops them out of diapause right away. We have no idea why, how it works, but it's a nice trick to be able to break a lot of diapauses really quickly. So we can very precisely then break diapause at, you know, 5, 50, uh, 50, 100 days. You see this nice straight line relationship that longer they're in diapause, the more uh, the costly it is in terms of trade-off with fertile eggs. Okay, is this the mother or the father that's in charge? If you, if you cross a diaposing male, one that's been in diapause, a non-diaposing female, no problem at all. It's only a problem if the mother had been in diapause. So that's, uh, there's a cost there to the mother, but not to the, to the father. And as so here's a consequence, what we see in these flesh flies is the flesh, the females wait to the last minute. They wait a little, as late as they can to enter diaposis. They want to make that diapause as short as possible. The males, there's no cost, so they, they enter diapause. And, uh, so the threshold for their entering diapause is much lower, and they'll, they'll enter diapause uh, at uh, much earlier in the season. Okay, we've, we've done quite a bit with uh, interest in asking that question. Well, what... You know, diapause occurring in a whole bunch of different species here. Are they, uh, to what degree is that toolbox, for example, the genetic toolbox for diapause the same? Uh, so this experiment was uh, sort of our first one in this area where we compared, once we had, oops, once we had a uh, uh, transcriptome for the flesh fly, we compared the diapausing transcriptome of the flesh fly with C. elegans, which has the dour state, the, sort of the nematode equivalent of diapause, with the Drosophila, which you know, it has a rather poor diapause, but there's a bit of a uh, reproductive uh, rest there. We anticipated seeing all kinds of transcripts that were going to be the same in all these diapausing stages. Not so much. As you can see, uh, for this comparison, there were only 10 transcripts that were shared in those diapausing uh, uh, groups. Now, granted, these are fairly distant uh, groups, and I'm sure when you compare more closely related uh, flies, for example, or something like that, you're going to get uh, a lot more commonality. But when you go at least at this distance, there's not much in common. And what this is really saying is, I think, that you can get that diapause phenotype uh, many different ways. And just sort of that example, when you think about that example I said about the cell cycle, well, you can, cell cycle arrest is very important, but you can make a cell cycle arrest by, you know, shutting down a number of different genes and get the same uh, end effect. So I think that's really uh, what is happening there. Now, some of the, most of these genes that are in common tend to be ones that are in, in metabolic genes that are involved in that, in that transition from uh, aerobic to anaerobic uh, uh, metabolism, things like Pepsi-K and things that are involved in the pyruvate uh, metabolism are uh, some of the dominant ones that show up in that, um, in that area. So again, this is sort of what I uh, just implied. There, there are many shared traits uh, that you'll see across diapause, and there are a few common mechanisms, but that similar diapause phenotypes can be derived from very different mechanisms. And that, that was not what I anticipated happening, but I think uh, and especially now as we get more and more information on this, it seems to be the case of what, uh, what is happening. So that whole idea by you know, understanding how diapause is regulated in one species is going to be translated quickly to a lot of other species sort of uh, is, is, doesn't look very promising in, in many ways. Okay, now I'd like to uh, switch over a bit to some of our more recent experiments with Culex pipians. Uh, this mosquito is the one that does uh, a vector of West Nile virus. And it has a reproductive diapause. The male, they mate in the fall, the males die, and it's only the fertilized females that, that survive the winter, and in, they're in this uh, um, state of diapause. And you, it's, it's a response to short days, and you see and there's a developmental rest, the follicles don't develop, and they have these really big uh, fat reserves. And just the, when we look at the uh, ovarian arrest, we're plotting here follicle size, this is age, adult age, if um, the animal has been in, uh, is not in, has been exposed to a long day, you see the follicles grow up here to about the 75, uh, about this level. And, and at this point, then they stop unless they get a blood meal. Then it goes a lot higher. But if they don't get a blood meal, that's where they stop. Those that are in diapause come out and the follicles just grow a little bit. Now, and this is weeks in diapause here at a different time scale. Those that are in diapause, again, starting here. Now, 
they do, throughout diapause, there's a gradual, very slow growth of their follicles. It's not like they've completely arrested and then turn on. There is a slow, gradual development of those follicles. But you can see it takes about 20 weeks until they reach the same stage as these non-diapausers did in three days. So a dramatic difference in, in how long there it takes them to get to that point. The other aspect is the uh, uh, very conspicuous fat accumulation in these mosquitoes. Look at here, total lipid input. Four days after adult emergence, you see the black is the diapause. You see a little bit of an increase here. It is significant. But by eight days, a really dramatic difference, about twice the amount of fat uh, sequestered by uh, the mosquitoes at that point. And even by looking at them, you see how fat this female is and how skinny this female is. You can actually look at them and, and know that that one's in diapause and the other one is not. So those are those criteria, the fat accumulation and, lip, and uh, follicle size are the criteria that we that we mainly use. Well, one of the, we're sort of starting a, a number of different uh, things here with uh, uh, Pipians. And uh, this, this is Megan Muti, one of my uh, graduate students who just got her degree. Uh, I don't know why she's eating ice cream and looking so crazy, but that's, uh, that's the case. Um, and these are the clot genes. And I'm not going to go into any uh, detail here at all. Uh, this is the period gene and timeless you may have heard of. And you know, they form a heterodimer that helps to run this clock. And they, there's been a lot of uh, information, uh, you know, so much clock work has been done on circadian rhythms, you know, these daily rhythms that occur. Um, but what is not clear is if the same clock that drives these circadian rhythms, if that same clock also runs the seasonal clock, the photoperiodic response. Now, intuitively, I would say, well, yes, of course, if you have a mechanism to run the clock, you're, it, it's probably the same thing. But the thing that uh, may, has made us hesitate for quite a while about that is an old experiment actually David Saunders did with uh, some per null mutants that, of Drosophila that did not express the period gene. They became arrhythmic, you know, locomotor activities, arrhythmic, but they were still capable of entering diapause, which sort of suggested well, maybe in, in that case, again, realizing Drosophila isn't a great model for diapause, but it is certainly suggested that you know, possibly a different clock system may be involved in, in the uh, photoperiodic timer. So our, Megan's goal here with her thesis was to try to find out if uh, these clock genes are playing a role in, in the diapause response of Culex pipians. Um, indeed, what you see here, here's the timeless gene showing its characteristic expression going up here at the beginning of the SCOTA phase. And uh, what we see here, one week in non-diapausing animal showing that kind of response, one week old diapausing animal, it looks like the response is being uh, dampened a little bit in diapause. And one month old, there's still a little rhythm here, but it's, uh, again, kind of dampened. Three months in diapause, again, a bit of a rhythm, but dampened. And then when diapause is broken, they revert to that, uh, that cycle. So it looks like the clock uh, does continue to tick during diapause. And that's in contrast to uh, what some people found is the hibernating mammals that seem to shut down their clock during, uh, during diapause. And we actually think our uh, fly pupae sh probably shut down their clock during diapause. But Culex does remain active. It's okay, long day. This is a uh, uh, period with the double-stranded uh, injection. You can see that when you did that for the short day animals that should have done this, the follicles developed uh, very nicely. So they uh, averted diapause when period gene was knocked down. Likewise, when you look at the lipid content, they took on the lipid content of a non-diapausing animal. They, did, they failed to make that accumulation. So suggesting that period was really important in that, in that process. Uh, the gene timeless, uh, again, succeeded in knocking it down. When you knock down timeless, you also knock down period. So there's some sort of interaction between these genes. You can't knock down just the one without knocking down the other. And in this case, uh, again, a short day animal averted uh, diapause. I mean, the, the egg follicle size was that of a, of a non-diapauser. Now, curiously, the, the fat was not affected. So we have here a situation where you affected one aspect of the diapause, the, the egg follicle development, but not the fat accumulation. It's kind of sort of the first time we've been able to, you know, tease apart some difference in, uh, in those two features of the diapause. Well, another gene that we were interested in is one that's actually 
downstream of the clock a little bit, something called pigment dispersing factor, PDF. Um, this is expressed usually in the same uh, clock genes, that, the same uh, cells that produce the clock genes. And PDF um, knocked down, again confirming knocked down here, but not affecting any of those other uh, clock genes. And when you knock down PDF, you um, really, you get the opposite effect. You make a long day mosquito take on some of the attributes of a diapause one. The follicle size is much lower, and you can see they pack on um, a lot of fat. So essentially we have a, here a gene that we can knock down that makes the animal switch from non-diapause to diapause, whereas the other ones are going diapause, not by making that attribute. So, that in, in uh, sort of summary of these results shows that knocking down, and I didn't show you all this data, but knocking down some of the negative regulators of the circadian clock uh, prevent short day females from entering diapause. And uh, this PDF uh, causes long day mosquitoes to enter a diapause like state. And we conclude from this that actually a functional clock is essential for this mosquito diapause. Okay, moving on down, so we have pretty convinced that the clock is important for the diapause. Now, looking at sort of the, toward the other end of, this, uh, of the uh, pathway, juvenile hormone's been known as a regulator of this diapause for a long time. Um, when you look at synthesis of juvenile hormone, the non diapause one has a, sp a big spike of JH activity soon after emergence, whereas those that don't enter diapause, I mean those that do enter diapause, have very, very low levels of this hormone, juvenile, uh, juvenile hormone. And indeed, you can add JH to these diapausing animals and break them out of diapause immediately. So a lot of good data suggesting that this, one of the attributes of this diapause is a shutdown of juvenile hormone production, and then for diapause to be broken, you, you turn on JH uh, production again. Well, the other, uh, another signaling pathway that we were quite interested in exploring uh, was the insulin signaling pathway. And you know, just a little background here on insulin signaling, it's kind of an interesting difference between mammals and invertebrates. Mammals are known, they have you know, a, a single receptor and a single peptide generally that, that operates. But in, uh, insects and other invertebrates only have a, a single insulin receptor, but they have lots and lots of insulin-like peptides. Drosophila has uh, seven, Bombyx has 30, C. elegans has 37 of these insulin-like peptides. They're made in cells in the brain, released out into the circulation, and they're known to have a number of effects on fat body, imaginal uh, disc, ovaries, and other tissues. So, there's a very, it's a really a strange thing where you have this a single receptor, but all these different uh, insulin-like peptides, many of which we have no idea what in the earth they're doing. But our interest in this insulin signaling pathway was prompted by the literature on dower formation in C. elegans. The dower formation, that dower pathway, was worked out very nicely in C. elegans, and the major players, they call them, you know, DAF-16, DAF-9, DAF-12, and so on, uh, for dower formation. Well, these are actually all members of the insulin signaling pathway. So our approach here was to, oh, let's see if those, some of those similar genes are doing, uh, doing something interesting in, in uh, mosquito diapause as well. So we've, we've gone after the insulin receptor, or DAF2, and FOXO, and, and some of these genes to see uh, roles that they may play. Essentially, again, using uh, RNAi, double strand RNA, to knock down these select genes. Much of this work has been done by um, Chao Ho Sim, a postdoc in my lab at the time. He's now on the faculty at, uh, at Baylor University in, in Texas. But basically, we're, we're injecting our double strand RNA day after eclosion, and then check them out uh, four or eight days later. Okay, when you look at total lipid content, in this case, uh, lip, this is lipid assays after we've knocked down that DAF16 or FOXO uh, gene. You can see that if we knock down FOXO, we get dramatic uh, suppression of, um, of lipid occurring. So you simulate the diapause uh, type state by, uh, I mean the non-diapause state by, uh, by knocking out DAF16, FOXO. And um, in this case, uh, yeah, we we're looking at the follicle size rather than the fat. So here's our, our traditional non-diapausing animal. Here's a control with a 
degallate. Here's the, here's the diapause follicle size. But here's a critical one. When we knock down the insulin receptor, we mimic the diapause state in that, in that creature. And then we can go on and uh, actually add JH to these animals. In this case, again, looking at follicle size or controls here, uh, non-diapause, diapause. And then if we add juvenile hormone, we can restore, we can restore the follicle size. So the JH uh, uh, will counter that effect and you can rescue uh, that knockdown uh, in that way. And this led us initially to a, a rather simple model that suggested in non-diaposing animals, insulin acts through insulin receptor, helping to trigger JH synthesis that leads to ovarian development and concurrently suppressing FOXO. In the diaposing state, by comparison, when insulin isn't present, insulin receptor is not activated, JH is not uh, activated, and also you remove the suppression on FOXO, leading to the fat hypertrophy and resistance to stress and some of the features of the diapause uh, syndrome. Well, as I said, you know, there are a whole bunch of these different insulin-like uh, peptides, so which which ones, uh, are they all doing the same thing or are there specific ones that are really important? Well, in the adult mosquito, this ILP1, 2, and 5 are the dominant ones that are present. And uh, you can see that uh, ILP1, there's a big difference in the amount in uh, non diapause and diapause. Uh, ILP2, not, this is not statistically significant. ILP5, big difference here. So, Five and one look like the potential players that might be involved. And indeed, uh, when we, um, we can knock down these, again, just showing that we can do the knockdowns of both of those ILPs. And the, the critical thing here is the, the follicle size, again, the non-diapause uh, condition, and here's our diapause standard. You can see that when we knock down ILP5, it had no effect at all, whereas when we knock down ILP1, uh, you mimic the effect. So we, we think that this is pointing to the fact that ILP1 is very critical for that shutdown. And again, we can go in, add juvenile hormone to this system, rescue the effect with juvenile hormone. Um, juvenile hormone also suppresses FOXO. You can see a dramatic uh, suppression of FOXO when juvenile hormone is present. Again, leading on to a, a somewhat modification of the uh, model where we now have for non-diapause insulin like peptide 1 acting through here and now we add another uh, suppressor here from juvenile hormone synthesis that shuts down this response whereas in diapause uh, we're getting uh, blockage of these effects when, when the hormone is not present. Okay, um, okay so how is JH regulated? Uh, there are two neuropeptides that are known to be regulating uh, juvenile hormone. One is a lot of tropin that has a tropic effect on stimulating that corpus allotum to produce JH. The other is a lot of statin that sort of uh, inhibits the, um, the synthesis of juvenile hormone. And here when we compare diapause and non-diapause, you see there's a pretty major difference in the amount of a lot of, trop a lot of tropin between these two uh, non-diapause and diapause, whereas a lot of statin seems to be the same in both of those cases. So this makes a lot of statin as perhaps a, an important regulator of, of the corpus allotum in, in this situation. Indeed, again, we can knock down uh, a lot of tropin uh, gene using RNAi um, and knocks down fairly nicely. And juvenile hormone can again rescue that effect when we add JH to an animal that has had the allototropin knocked uh, down. Again, leading to, I, I promise, this is the final version of this one. Uh, uh, the non-diapausing animal, again, isn't like peptide going here. What we've added here is a, another arrow coming from a lot of tropin to help stimulate juvenile hormone synthesis, uh, leading to the non-diapause response. Then the diapause, again, no allototropin. Uh, and uh, get the same, the rest of the pattern that we had before leading to the diapause uh, phenotype. Now, the, um, <clears throat> there are a couple of other uh, things that we know that come up in diapause. The antioxidant enzymes of, of uh, catalase, when you look at the, uh, the gene expression for the gene encoding catalase, you see a big, uh, in this case, diapause, non-diapause difference, SOD2. Uh, major difference here as well. Well, we use this to see if, uh, if FOXO is maybe influencing uh, 
this, these genes, and indeed it appears that it is. In this case, uh, again, FOXO, the expression of this gene FOXO, you can see we can knock it down very nicely. When we do knock down FOXO, we also knock down the expression of catalase and SOD2. So getting at the beginnings of uh, deciphering a pathway that's leading you know, from insulin to FOXO, and then FOXO is turning on some of these genes that are, that are involved. And so we wanted to pursue this a bit, um, a bit further to see if, uh, if FOXO could be uh, indeed turning on many of these different aspects of the, um, of the uh, uh, diapause phenotype. And to do that, we've uh, generated a FOXO antibody for the mosquito and do uh, a procedure known as chip sequencing to identify FOXO targets. This is a, a mechanism to uh, actually identify the targets of FOXO so that we can perhaps find out uh, their involvement. So that's really uh, uh, the tack we, we've taken here. And indeed, when we do that, we get about 72 genes that have FOXO binding sites uh, on them. So far, we've only looked at about 11 of those, uh, but those that, uh, uh, certainly some that, uh, the ones we've checked, uh, there are several that are involved in stress tolerance, metabolic pathways, lifespan extension, cell cycle and growth regulation, circadian rhythm uh, sorts of events. So these are all seem like reasonable targets that might, might indeed be important for the diapause phenotype. So to verify that, we've uh, uh, just to check if our, uh, to validate the FOXO binding, uh, this really shows that indeed, yes, our uh, FOXO, when Anna uh, FOXO is present, uh, you get, uh, you know, this, this kind of difference showing, showing that indeed we are getting binding for those critical genes that we had looked at in the last uh, uh, slide. And then the uh, uh, next slide just shows, in this case, we go back to those genes and look if there's a diapause, non-diapause difference. So the white is non-diapause and diapause. In each of these cases, you see a lot higher expression of those particular genes uh, during the um, diapause state. So suggesting that indeed these are ones that are relevant uh, for diapause. <clears throat> okay, so we still have a lot more genes to work through in that uh, pathway with the, the FOXO, but we do think that uh, that is leading us toward uh, a pathway of, uh, that might help to explain this enormous diversity of the diapause response and how you could signal through FOXO and get this proliferation of really fairly diverse uh, sorts of responses. Okay, this, uh, throw this slide up. You know, it, okay, is the insulin signaling this FOXO pathway, is that important in other insect diapauses uh, as well? Well, uh, this is data from, uh, from the flesh fly again, the pupil diapause, and you can see that many of the players in the insulin signaling pathway have been altered here in relation to diapause as well. Now, they aren't all the same, but you can see all these insulin-like peptides are down. Um, the insulin receptor is actually up, but it's not doing anything. Um, so in FOXO, there's, you know, so there are many, uh, many of the same players, or at least the pathways, are indeed uh, um, being affected. So uh, we think that indeed there, this insulin signaling pathway is going to emerge as a really important signaling pathway for many of the diapauses. And certainly it seems to be true for the dower formation in C. elegans and the Drosophila's reproductive diapause and the Culex diapause and now in... Uh, uh, sarcophaga pupil diapause as well. So where are we at this point? Uh, we'd love to go the whole way from reception of that photoperiodic information, the whole way downstream to the expression of that diapause phenotype. And where we, we still have some uh, significant black boxes here, but we think we're pretty confident a functional clock is essential that probably is somehow acting through this uh, clock downstream gene, PDF, and then, you know, from here to the JH and insulin signaling pathway, we, we still have pretty much a black box, but, uh, and then, but from here, we feel pretty confident we're going through this transcription factor FOXO that then proliferates into many of these different uh, diverse uh, features of diapause. Now, I'm under no illusion that it's the only signaling pathway that's important, but I think it's at least one of the very major ones that uh, probably results in that generation of the uh, diverse features of the diapause uh, uh, phenotype. But still, yeah, I mean, this, how does that how's that information stored and how does the animal know when to act upon it? There's a lot 
this is sort of where the black box is. It's, it's shrunk a bit, but it's still, there's still a big black box there. Okay, and this is my final slide. Just pay tribute to some of the folks that I've uh, involved in this. Actually, the experiments, this is the experiments they talked today, uh, Megan Muti, who's now a postdoc, did most of the clock work. And then uh, Chao Ho Sim, again, former postdoc, who's now in the faculty at Baylor, uh, did a lot of the um, insulin signaling work that I just talked about. You know, I might just, so much of the mosquito work was, has been NIH funded. I might just say a couple words about a couple of these other grants because they're diapos related to. Yesterday I talked about our polar program grant with Belgica, but the NSF uh, grant we have currently is something I didn't get a chance to talk about, but that focuses on uh, what we think are some important epigenetic regulators of diapos. These mosquitoes, I mean, mosquitoes, the flesh fly, um, if the mother has been through diapause, her offspring cannot go into diapause. There's something, she shuts off the capacity for diapause in her offspring. And it, I mean, it's something that makes sense ecologically because that means that the first generation that comes out in the spring cannot enter diapause when the days, and, and otherwise it would because the days are still short in early May. Uh, so this prevents that from happening. They go through another generation, and then they can respond to long day. So we think that that's an epigenetic effect, and we have a, a number of major epigenetic players that seem to be uh, coming out in that. So I'm pretty excited where that, that is going. We didn't get a chance to talk about that. Our USDA uh, NRA response is some work uh, in NRA, NRA, that's, that's something else. NRI, please. <laughs> I realize I'm in gun country, so I, you know, NRA is a uh, fair game. But okay, uh, USDA funding is for some work on the pupil diapause of heliothus. This is you know, things like the uh, cotton bollworm and uh, you know, major agricultural pests economically. They also enter a pupil diapause. And a number of years ago, the uh, um, Japanese workers found that there's a hormone, a neuropeptide, diapause hormone that puts Bombyx mori eggs into their embryonic diapause. Well, we found there's a gene encoding this same diapause hormone as present in Heliothus. And we tried desperately to put our Heliothus into diapause by injecting diapause hormone into them. It didn't work at all. But we inject it into one that's already in diapause, it pops them out of diapause. So here's one hormone in Bombyx, puts them into diapause, a very identical hormone in Heliothus pops them out of diapause. So we're now taking that 24 amino acid neuropeptide, this diapause hormone, we found there's only seven amino acids that are really essential for activity, and we're modifying that uh, compound. And we now have some um, agents, some compounds, some agonists that are about 50 times more potent than diapause hormone itself in breaking the diapause. So we're arguing that we might, and we also have some now that can uh, prevent the entry into diapause, and we also have an antagonist that will prevent the breaking of diapause. So we're arguing that you know, some of these tools you know, might be used uh, essentially to cause ecological suicide in these uh, animals if they, you know, break them out of diapause prematurely or prevent their going into diapause at the right time or prevent their breaking out of diapause at the right time. It could be something that uh, uh, pie in the sky, but you know, at least put in a grant proposal that you know, might be used for uh, manipulating those populations somewhere down the line. So that's what that, that stuff is about. I didn't, Really got a chance to talk about it. But I did talk about it after all, didn't I? Okay, so anyway, thanks so much for your kind attention, and uh, it's been fun being here. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>